Yeah, welcome everybody to today's talk within the Design++ Plus Plus, uh, speaker series provided to you by the Design++ Plus Plus initiative of uh, ETH in Zurich. My name is uh, Michael Kraus and I'm happy to be your host today again. Uh, it is also my special pleasure to welcome our guest and lecturer of today, Professor Pierluigi uh, Acunto from TO Munich. Before I introduce uh, you to our speaker and his talk, let me shortly provide some background information. The Design++ Plus Plus speaker series is a recurring event where we will provide uh, invitations to upcoming events in due time uh, via email, our homepage, and even our YouTube channel. You can find all updates uh, on the states, the speakers, the topics of the talks uh, of this uh, spring semester on our homepage. Uh, you can subscribe to our calendar to receive the invitations automatically. Uh, and you can also go to our uh, YouTube homepage, which uh, I warmly invite you to have a look at uh, because we have stored there all previous presentations. Uh, the link can be found here. Uh, for Design Plus, on the background at the moment, there is a number of uh, professors from uh, architecture, civil engineering, and uh, computer sciences of ETH in Zurich uh, involved in this Design Plus Plus initiative. And uh, for running the day-to-day -day business, uh, there is a team of three leading postdocs, uh, as I said, responsible for operation of the Immersive Design Lab, uh, together with steering and organizing the research and teaching activities. A growing number of scientists and chairs uh, and professorships is uh, associated to Design++. And if you're interested in the future uh, on the connection of AI, machine learning, and extended reality with the AEC industry, uh, just reach out to us. We are more than happy to discuss further any ideas or projects. Yeah, um, having said all that on the background of Design++ Plus Plus and our speaker series, now let me introduce you to our speaker of today. As I said, uh, it is Professor Pierluigi da Quinto from TU Munich. Uh, he is uh, currently assistant professor uh, for Structural Design at the Department of Architecture of the Technical University of Munich. He holds a degree in Building Engineering and Architecture from the University of Pisa, got it in 2007, and also a Master of Architecture uh, uh, from Architectural Association in London. He completed his uh, doctorate with distinction at ETH Zurich some time ago under the supervision of Professor Schwartz uh, in 2018. And uh, yeah, Perluigi's research explores the convex of architecture and structural engineering through computational design and emerging construction technologies. His uh, recent research developments are located in equilibrium-based computational design and structural form finding assisted by machine learning aiming to develop a design framework in which the machine actively supports the human designer for the early stages of the design process. Given that, uh, the talk of today will be about conceptual design of structures at the interface between human and machine intelligence. Yeah, I can uh, warmly invite you to have a look at Perluigi's uh, homepage here and his papers. And uh, as I said before, we will host all that background information given here on our YouTube homepage associated with this video. And uh, yeah, that's it from my side. And now I would hand over to you, Pierluigi. Thank you for giving the talk and stage is yours. Thank you very much, Michael, Roman and Daniel for organizing this talk. And uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be here, especially to be back uh, uh, within the ETH community. I see here in the audience, there are so many uh, former colleagues, friends, and uh, people that actually collaborates on uh, what I will show now. So I would like to mention that what I'm going to show now is very much the results of collaboration with many of you that are uh, kindly decided to spend this afternoon, or let's say one hour of this afternoon uh, to listen to what I'm going to show today. So I share my screen uh, and then we can get started. I think you can see the screen now. Perfect. Okay. Good. Well, so thanks again. And uh, as I mentioned, I started uh, here at Munich since uh, one year and a few months as assistant professor of structural design. 
at the Department of Architecture within the School of Engineering and Design. And uh, within this uh, uh, position now uh, that I have, I'm trying to develop very much further what I started at ETH Zurich and specifically try to uh, develop new ideas and concepts and methods uh, within the field of structural design. Specifically, one direction is to try to bring together structural design with uh, machine learning and try to see how much uh, uh, it is possible to generate uh, a design platform in which both machine and human designer can collaborate to design new structural systems. So, well, the topic of today, uh, this uh, conceptual design of structure, the interface between human and machine intelligence is really about uh, uh, showing the latest developments uh, in these fields uh, that we, uh, as I said, uh, I had the pleasure to uh, uh, develop together with uh, several collaborators as uh, were uh, first at ETH Zurich and now more or less uh, very widespread all over the world. So uh, I would like, first of all, to start with uh, uh, introducing more or less uh, uh, and starting from the concept of structural design. So introducing what is our approach and our vision in structural design. And to do this, I would like to bring this quote by Pierluigi Nervi. Uh, Nervi is saying that, as you know, Nervi is uh, one of the most famous structural engineer and designer of the 20th century and uh, was is saying when it is uh, trying to describe what is structural design, is saying that uh, the method of bringing loads down to the foundations within the minimum use of materials were interesting, but never enough. I still remember the long and patient work to find an agreement between the static necessities and the desire to obtain something which for me will have a satisfying appearance. So from this quote, it's very clear that structural design is not, it's not just about structural optimization. It's not just about minimizing the amount of materials in the structure that we design, but it's very much bringing in other aspects. And these aspects are coming from other fields, uh, uh, all in all, uh, from ar architecture in the first place, uh, questions related to the quality of the space, uh, the aesthetics of the structures that we design. And uh, all in all, we can say that structural design is really bringing uh, and finding a good negotiation between the static necessities and the freedom of architectural expression. Clearly, within this, we include uh, all the topics connected to uh, the buildings that we design in terms of constructions and building physics as well. One of the uh, most interesting projects of NERVI is this one here, it's the hangar in uh, Orbetello. And this is actually one of, the, uh, of a series of hangars that uh, uh, NERVI designs, uh, trying in this to minimize the use of material, but at the same time, as we can see, designing a structure that is extremely elegant in a way that uh, uh, you see this uh, very, interesting uh, vaults uh, made of these uh, trusses that are prefabricated trusses in uh, uh, reinforced concrete that are then assembled in a quite uh, efficient way to generate uh, this uh, floating structure that is supported in uh, six uh, on six tripods. And uh, uh, in these projects, uh, that is actually only the skeleton of the project, we see already this negotiation between the structural, the static necessities and the uh, architectural expression. It is interesting to see that uh, Nervi actually made use of uh, graphic statics in order to define the shape uh, of the hangar, but at the same time to check uh, what is the behavior of the structure under asymmetric loading. So graphic statics, for those uh, that don't know about this, it's a, a very ancient way. So uh, it's a method to design structures and to analyze structures that make use of uh, geometry and uh, everything is based on two diagrams, the form and the force diagram. So you see the form diagram is here on the right and shows the geometry of the structures under the uh, applied loads. And on the left, we see the force diagram that represents the equilibrium of the forces within the structure. And clearly by uh, playing with these two diagrams that are 
interconnected to each other. The moment we change one, the other changes accordingly because the corresponding edges between the two diagrams should stay and they are constrained to be parallel. By playing with this diagram, it is possible to explore and generate different forms according to specific structural requirements in terms of the, uh, the magnitude of the forces or vice versa. Also modify the form and see how the forces are changing. Well, it is uh, interesting that uh, Nervi himself, uh, when uh, talking about uh, the academic training of the designer, so in a book that he wrote uh, about uh, what uh, would be the best path for uh, a young designer to take in order to become a structural engineer and a structural designer, he's saying this, uh, I believe that graphical statics should play an important role in this last educational phase. So it's talking about uh, the last educational phase of an engineer and a structural designer. Since its, produce, its procedures give a direct understanding much better than then afforded by analytical methods of force systems and their composition, decomposition and equilibrium. It's interesting that Nervi is even said that graphic statics should play an important role, not only in the early phase uh, of the education of the uh, engineers and the architects, where it is important to learn about the concepts of equilibrium and uh, structural behavior, but also in the last phase. And in the last phase specifically, it's important because graphic statics gives a very intuitive, a very direct, a very synthetic approach to the reading and design of structures. And this is what is uh, very often uh, missed by very experienced engineers uh, in terms of understanding actually having the global picture on how the forces are uh, transferred within structures, how we can make use of forces in order to design the structures. So graphic statics, as I said, uh, it's uh, an approach that is uh, quite uh, uh, developed uh, several uh, centuries ago, specifically a very first uh, approach uh, uh, into the use of graphic statics is by uh, Varignon, and it is uh, in the uh, first half of the 18th century even. And Varignon uh, recognized that the form of a cable structure that is subjected to hanging laws could be directly related to the magnitude of the internal forces. And this can be represented in, two in these two diagrams. As I said before, the form diagram, we see here the cable with the hanging loads and the force diagram. So for each uh, element, for each edge of the form diagram, there is a corresponding edge in the force diagram. Now, the interesting thing is that in the force diagram, uh, the corresponding edge is parallel. And at the same time, the length of the edge represents the magnitude of the force that is inside the edge in the form diagram. So for example, if we want to recognize and evaluate uh, how big are the forces in the cables that is taking this shape because of the hanging loads, we just go to the force diagram and we measure, literally measure the length of the corresponding edges. And from there, we see, for example, that the maximum forces in our cable are clearly in the uh, parts of the cable that are connected to the supports that are more inclined. So these uh, uh, methods is a series of geometric constructions uh, based on these two diagrams was then very much uh, developed into an autonomous discipline at the end of the 19th century. And it is uh, very much due uh, to the ETH professor Karl Kuhlmann. He collected a series of geometric construction for structural engineering in his book, The Graphische Static. And then afterwards, uh, this uh, theory of graphic statics was developed uh, and connected further to uh, mathematics, specifically projective geometry. And this is due to the contribution of uh, James Clerk Maxwell, the famous uh, Scottish scientist, and uh, Luigi Cremona, uh, another Italian geometer that shows how form and force diagrams actually are nothing else than the projection the 2D form and force diagram are projection of three-dimensional polyhedra that can be regarded as the area stress functions of the structures. So all in all, uh, these diagrams can be generated uh, 
in a uh, direct way by using this uh, reciprocal transformation of projective geometry, specifically the polarity. So, well, uh, in the last few years, uh, uh, there was uh, a quite uh, a very important developments of all these methods uh, into uh, an approach that can be, on the one hand, extends the methods from 2D to 3D, and on the other hand, also bring in this approach that uh, at the time was done and was developed uh, mostly manually into computational tools for structural design. And actually, there is a, a huge amount of work in this direction. Uh, ETH Zurich specifically with the work of uh, the chair of uh, Joseph Schwartz and uh, uh, Philip Locke and uh, all in all, uh, all around the world uh, uh, work uh, that is done at the University of Cambridge, uh, SOM, uh, UPenn, uh, and so on. So uh, very much uh, uh, an interesting research topic that has been developed uh, in the last uh, few years. Specifically, uh, our approach and our contribution to these developments in graphic statics is the introduction of the so-called vector-based graphic statics, which is about uh, using uh, vectors in order to represent uh, form, uh, um, to, to represent the, the, the edges of the structures in both form and force diagrams. Uh, this is uh, different to other approaches to graphic statics that use uh, polyhedra, for example, for the representation of uh, three-dimensional force diagrams. So in our case, uh, we use this uh, kind of a direct extension of 2D graphic statics into 3D by keeping everything uh, made of linear elements, so this is why we call them vectors. And again, uh, uh, corresponding edges between form and force diagrams are parallel to each other. So you see from this animation that is in this, uh, in the end possible to transform one diagram or the others according to the necessity of the design and then check the transformation of the others accordingly. So how does it work? Well, to build up a three-dimensional force diagram using the vector-based approach, uh, starting, for example, from a structure that is uh, in equilibrium, like this self-stress tetrahedron we see on the uh, top uh, left of the slide, uh, we go through a process of uh, uh, that is based on graph theory that is about uh, developing and drawing the graph of the structure and based on this defining the order of the cycles of the force polygon. So in the force diagram, uh, we have several force polygons that represents the equilibrium of every node of the structure in the form diagram. For example, we see here the form diagram, the node A, in the node A, there are these four forces coming together, three in compression that we represent in blue and one in tension the, uh, that we represent in red. And uh, if we build up this force polygon, keeping the parallelism between the corresponding edges, we have a closed cycle that represents uh, the equilibrium of that node. We can repeat the same construction for all the other nodes of the structure, and in the end, we get uh, all the force polygons and, as such, the equilibrium of all the nodes of the structures. Then, clearly, the next step would be to bring together all these force polygons by overlapping corresponding vectors. So, for example, we see the bar F7 in our force in our form diagram here can be uh, represented by two force polygons since we have within the bar two forces, uh, one applied to the node B, the other one to the node A, and these are represented by two uh, vectors in the force diagram that we can now overlap. And as such, we can do the same for all the other corresponding vectors and eventually bring everything into one geometry that is our vector base uh, force diagram. Really, uh, at this point, uh, we see already that we have a special situation here. So uh, automatically, by bringing together all, all the force polygon, we generate a new polygon that is this uh, generated by F4, F6, uh, uh, and again, the repetition of F4, F6. And this somehow corresponds uh, in the uh, topology. So the uh, graph of the form diagram to the intersection between the bar F4, F6. Now, this intersection actually has no correspondence in the form diagram. 
this and now not to go too much into details but uh, uh, if uh, we make this uh, operation to us and you know that the intersection of these two bars is just like uh, planarizing the graph and obtaining as a consequence the dual graph that represents the uh, underlying graph of the force diagram now this is uh, just very very quickly uh, all the theory behind the construction of vector based diagrams uh, and uh, it is only to explain this uh, in order to build these diagrams we make uh, very much use of graph theory and here we see for example another application this is uh, a tensegrity structure form and force diagram in this case, uh, the two diagrams can also be inverted. We can consider the force diagram as a structure on its own, and then the force diagram would be the initial form diagram. Now, not to go too much into detail on this, but uh, uh, the interesting thing is that since we have clear rules how to build up form and force diagrams in 3D, we can also embed them into computational tools. And this is uh, what we did with this uh, plugin for Grasshopper that uh, we very uh, recently released uh, this VGS uh, plugin is still uh, in a beta phase. Uh, we are still making some adjustments, but clearly uh, it's already good to uh, be used for doing uh, structural design uh, uh, tasks and uh, processes. Here we see, for example, this uh, very simple arch bridge. We can operate at the same time on form and force diagrams in order to assess for example new structural forms or at the same time to modify the amount of the forces in the force diagram and check what is the consequence in terms of the geometry of the form and this is a process that is uh, very much about form finding another thing uh, is the possibility clearly to integrate certain constraints within the uh, structural system we design for example in this case we are imposing that uh, the forces in the suspension cable of this bridge are all the same. And this is nicely shown and uh, uh, operates uh, in the, uh, as a, as a uh, transformation in the force diagram by imposing that the corresponding edges of the suspension cables that are these red edges in the fan have all the same lengths. So by applying and imposing these geometric transformations on either the form or the force or the force diagram, we can embed certain constraints. So uh, do constraint-based form finding. This is another example of a compression-only structure for a bridge that's and developing as a project together with uh, Ole Oldbrook and, uh, and Norman Hack and his PhD student Xin Yan. Uh, and this uh, in order to uh, generates a structure for uh, a new technique in uh, 3D printing that is uh, called injection 3D printing concrete, 3D concrete printing. And uh, in this case, uh, you see again form and force diagram uh, based on this vector based approach. Uh, here, another example of a uh, half of a uh, um, self stress uh, roof structure. And then you see again the possibility to embed constraints, for example, to impose that uh, these uh, uh, blue uh, curves that are representing compression stress are matching, for example, a given surface. And this can be done quite uh, immediate by imposing these geometric constraints either on the form or the forces. This we see the, uh, the actually the roof structure the form diagram from top and from the front view and the corresponding force diagram. Uh, the force diagram by itself actually, again, since we are talking about a self stress structure, could be considered a structure on its own. So it's quite interesting to see how working with this uh, form and force diagram, it is always possible to generate uh, uh, every time new structure system. Now, uh, in order to go to the next level, uh, I will show now uh, a project that was developed mostly by my colleague, uh, Patrick Ole Olbrook, that's actually here with us. And uh, uh, I was supporting him during his PhD. And uh, what he developed is the combinatorial equilibrium modeling. And it is about inversing all the approach to the design of structures and starting rather from the topology of the structure. So the topology is this graph that shows the connectivity between the nodes and the uh, edges in a structure. 
So the idea uh, was to uh, try to start with this as an operative diagram in order to generate new structural system. On this diagram, embedding certain constraints. So first of all, uh, uh, making a distinction between certain elements that are called the trail edges that are transferring the forces from the points of application of the force to the supports in the uh, shortest uh, way. And then the deviation edges that are connecting uh, across uh, trails uh, deviations. And by doing this and imposing tension compression uh, to the edges, uh, it is possible then to generate uh, the form and the force diagrams. And uh, this is again, a form finding approach that is initiated by starting uh, this and embedding information on the topology of the structure. Clearly, what is interesting is that uh, at this point, uh, it is possible to operate on two levels at the level of the topology by changing the connectivity between the elements and the combinatorial uh, variation between tension and compression. And then for each of these uh, topology generates different metric variations and then exploring different uh, geom geometries that share the same topology. Clearly, this, as you can imagine, is opening up the possibility to design uh, uh, extremely uh, a, 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 an extreme wide range of structures in tension and compression. Again, also in this case, uh, together uh, supporting all, the, uh, we develop uh, a plugin for uh, Grasshopper, the CM plugin, and this also is uh, freely available and uh, open source software that can be used for the form finding of structures in equilibrium. Clearly, two. Uh, plugins can be even connected together. So uh, you can start uh, doing the form finding with the CM and then connecting these to the VGS to generate the force diagram and going on with the structural design. And clearly the interesting idea here is that uh, the, uh, this uh, approach allows to generate uh, completely different cross typological structures. So for example, here we see suspension bridges, uh, uh, arch bridges, uh, branching bridges, and clearly there is no even more the notion of what is a typology, it's rather working with the topologies and making hybrids in between different structures. So the, the uh, work cannot, it's not just limited to the design of bridges, the same, tool can be used also for design lar uh, large span roof structures, or for example, even the skeleton of a building. And you see here how much variation can be embedded into the design by playing with uh, uh, the, the, these parameters that are the combinatorial variation of tension compression and also the topology of the structure. Very recently, uh, together with Rafael Pastrana, we uh, were able to extend this and to develop uh, also a plugin for Compass. And specifically, Rafael was able even to further develop the optimization algorithm that is behind the CM by using automatic differentiation, then speeding up very much uh, the uh, operations that can be done in terms of optimization. And here is uh, an example of something that we are uh, now uh, presenting in a paper showing how much uh, uh, the, this uh, use of automatic differentiation that is a, a technique that is very much used in machine learning can be uh, uh, beneficial for improving the speeds of the convergence uh, in terms of the optimization within the CM. And this is very much used when we do form finding with specific constraints, for example, meshing certain boundary conditions. So the question now is, uh, uh, how can we make use of these tools? And uh, uh, we see that these tools potentially allow for the generation of a huge amount of different structures. Uh, by playing with these parameters, it is possible to have a huge design space uh, and uh, a very varied design space. Uh, at this point, the question is, how can we make use of the machine, uh, not only to uh, speed up the production of these uh, structures, but also to help the human designer into uh, navigating into design space. 
Uh, to his extent, I would like to bring in now this quote by Sergio Musmeci. This is uh, uh, something that Musmeci wrote uh, and was published in a book that was about uh, collecting all the uh, results of a seminar that was held uh, at the beginning of the 70s about the use of computers and uh, the possibility to generate uh, uh, structure with the computer. So in this case, Musmesh is talking about the use of computer for the creation of new structural form. And he says that it is evident that the computer can be of great help in the verification phase. But on the other hand, it is also evident that only if a way is found to use it also in the first phase, at the service of the inventive capacity of the designer, will it be possible to ensure that it can contribute to the research and creation of new and more efficient structural forms? So Musmechi is already giving for granted. This is uh, the first years in which computers are used uh, just to stress uh, in the field of structural engineering. So it's giving already for granted that sure, the computer could speed up and help uh, the analysis of structure, but actually the more interesting application of computers would be when they are used and the power of the computer is used in order to generate and create new structures together with the human design. Now, just to uh, contextualize, uh, if you don't know about uh, Sergio Musmeci, is actually, again, another uh, uh, one of the, 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 the greatest uh, structure engineer of the 20th century, possibly with uh, Nervi and Morandi and uh, many others clearly. But in this case, Musmeci was uh, quite standing out from the others uh, because of uh, his uh, uh, very uh, uh, great creativeness in the structural design process. And uh, most likely, you know, this example, this uh, uh, bridge in uh, Potenza on the Basento River. And this was designed like a shell and uh, was actually very much uh, uh, used uh, at the same time physical models and also analytical calculation to design this bridge. And then it's interesting that and then afterwards, uh, once he was uh, eventually able to uh, buy his own personal computer, was able to actually to check again and to even make a form find, a very rudimental form finding uh, you see here in the middle of the slides using his computer. So to mesh and to make the form finding of the structure, not anymore just using physical model, but a computational model. Unfortunately, unfortunately, Ms. Mesh uh, died quite uh, young, was not able really to go on with this idea of using the computer in a very creative way. Well, this was nevertheless for us a great inspiration. And uh, this is why we, uh, uh, to a certain extent, we tried eventually to use uh, uh, this uh, and to, to follow this direction in order to develop new ideas, tools, and methods uh, uh, to bring together structural design with uh, computational uh, capacity of the machine and specifically with machine learning. This application of uh, structural design to uh, machine learning, uh, what could we do even more to go beyond even uh, developing tools that are helping the uh, designer in the background, but uh, what would be the next step in order to be able to use the, uh, the, the machine really to collaborate and to propose uh, some solutions to the designer? So again, I bring this quote by Sergio Musmeci. He says, uh, when we speak of the use of electronic calculation in the field of structures, we generally mean to refer to the enormous possibilities it offers in the verification of the stability of very complex structures. I would like to take for granted these quantitative aspects of the use of the computer and draw attention in sense to the qualitative effects that its diffusion may have and will almost certainly will have in the field of structural design. These effects can be considered as the results of the interaction between the machine and the human inventive capacities and are bound to grow as the human being learns to use the machine to explore ever wider fields of possible solutions. So this really points into the application that I will show now that is very much about uh, using the tools that we have, these parametric tools to 
generates uh, a huge amounts of possible design solutions and then using the machine in order to help the human designer to navigate uh, these uh, design solutions and to guide the, the, the human designer into the design process and eventually and potentially also propose new structural design options. So this is really uh, a first step, I would say, towards the development of a computational structural design framework for human machine collaboration. So the idea is really to allow the human designer to be able to grasp these uh, huge and vast uh, uh, dimensions of the design space in order to be able to navigate this uh, uh, design space and be able to make decisions uh, throughout the design process. This is a work that we developed in collaboration with Carla Saldana, that's I think is also here I saw, and uh, Vahid Musavi at DTH Zurich, again also with uh, Patrick Ole Olbrook. The idea, uh, we uh, summarize this in this diagram, is to have this human machine collaboration platform in which uh, we have different tasks, different steps, uh, and these steps should not be intended as sequential, but rather uh, non-sequential steps that are about generating a certain amount of structures and then making to uh, filtering, a filter that is based on quantitative quantitative evaluation. Another one is more a selection that is made on the qualitative evaluation. And this is uh, uh, possible thanks to the machine that is able to cluster the generated design solutions in such a way that the human is able to uh, grasp and navigate into the design space. So as I said, the idea is that uh, actually there are completely different uh, possible processes. These operations can be repeated in a non-sequential way as many times as necessary. And these uh, diagrams are showing this, that actually each designer would approach the design in a different way and as such uh, operates and doing uh, this, uh, passing from one operation to another in a different way. So it is really about bringing in the designer as a collaborative part into the design process together with the machine. As we saw with the uh, combinatorial equilibrium model, it is possible to generate uh, huge amounts of structure. We see here from the topology that I showed before, these are all possible variations and actually these are only a minimal parts. Uh, for example, in these experiments, we were generating uh, 40,000 of these structures and uh, clearly at a certain point, it becomes quite complicated for the human designer to be able to grasp all these possible design variations. This is why we use a technique of machine learning that is the self-organizing map. This was also shown by uh, Ole Olbrich in a previous lecture last semester. And, uh, this uh, approach allows to uh, take the uh, multidimensional design space and uh, reduce this into a 2D map. And this 2D map, for example, in this case, a uh, 40 by 40 map of uh, clusters. And for each cluster, uh, this cluster represents a cluster of possible structures that are similar to that of the representative elements of the cluster within the latent space. Uh, so in the multidimensional space. Clearly the clustering can be done in several different ways that it is the designer that chooses which are the criteria to cluster. For example, in this case, we see the clustering was done according to the form. So similar structure close to each other. Uh, other criteria can be used at the same time. At the same time, clearly we can see how uh, other parameters are distributed within this map, for example. In, uh, uh, in this case, we see the load, load pass of the structure, uh, the, the mean load pass, and we see uh, here this, uh, uh, where it is raised that uh, we have the highest load pass and this, uh, in this specific case in the bottom left corner. So all these quantitative uh, measures that can be embedded into these uh, uh, gradient maps uh, can be used uh, to uh, facilitate the navigation of the user within this uh, self-organizing map. And clearly the users can uh, go back and forth within the map and uh, assess 
the quality of the structure in terms of qualitative aspects, but at the same time, gets all the information in terms of the quantitative aspects. Uh, as I, again, the load paths, the maximum forces, uh, the maximum lengths of the edges and so on and so forth. Uh, the next step would be this uh, the designer then uh, by navigating is making a selection of the structure that wants to uh, take uh, to the next step of the design process uh, and at the same time can discard completely other structural solutions this uh, uh, labeling of the structures can be then used as a, another step uh, on the side of the machine so learning from the uh, selection of the human designer what are the prefer and not prefer structure by the human designer. And this can be done with, a, um, for example, in this case, we use a gradient boosted tree, but can be a, any other algorithm can be used for the training and the learning process. And then uh, clearly at the certain points, at the moments the machine is uh, able to learn the preferences of the designer, can even go back to the initial parametric model and try to uh, generate new structures by its own that are possibly uh, closed uh, to the preference of the user according to the training phase. So in this case, for example, we see these three structures. These were structures that were uh, designed by the machine according to the preference uh, uh, of uh, me, Ole, and Carla. For example, this uh, video shows the uh, structure that's supposedly it's based on my uh, preferences in the, in the design process. I think actually this structure for sure would be a super interesting structure. I don't know if I was ever been uh, in the uh, position to design a structure like this. It's quite crazy. Maybe it doesn't work as a roof structures, but nevertheless, it's a very interesting one. So it's quite nice to see how the machine can be used to enhance the creativity of the design. Clearly, this should not be taken as a final step of the design. This could be, again, a starting point to start again a new sequence. So we went on with, the, uh, with this approach to try to embed other functions. For example, with the work of Federico Bertagna, we embed in not only structural considerations, but also solar analysis considerations and uh, operating in the same way. So working with the SOM and then uh, having these different parameters all together at the same time. Then clearly the next step would be uh, how to be able to have a more direct connection between the human and the machine so we saw before the idea uh, as uh, in this experiment we did on uh, high-rise towers uh, is to uh, make this uh, selection between uh, uh, the, the preferred and not preferred structure this clearly binary selection is uh, something very basic and uh, the question would be how can we enhance uh, this uh, uh, process. And so we are developing now uh, with Carla and Guo and, and together with all the another approach uh, to try to create a more qualitative uh, way how to uh, label the structures. And uh, the idea would be to try to extract uh, adjectives or let's say expressions that are very commonly used in the description of uh, structures and architectures and uh, use these as labels for the structures that we design. And then at this point, uh, clearly we can assign different labels for uh, the same structures and eventually we are able to uh, characterize the structure, not just with I like, I don't like this one, zero, but actually have a much more uh, uh, refined uh, description of the structure. Clearly, these together with all the quantitative parameters connected to the structure itself, like uh, load pass and the amount of forces and so on. All in all, then this can be used for the further training of the machine and then try to produce a new structural system. Okay, so I'm uh, at the end of the lecture. Again, I close uh, with uh, Musmechi. Another quote, uh, uh, but only when electronic computer is put in a position to present the forms that are produced in accordance with the designer's, so designer's so choices, will they be able to express their design inventiveness uh, uh, within the right range of variability of the parameters that they have judged to be truly decisive. 
I believe that one day, perhaps, perhaps not very far in the future, this will be the way of designing for a creative structural designer. The automatic calculation, far from limiting their imaginative possibilities, will represent efficient support for them, as well as a powerful means of amplifying their impacts on reality. So uh, I uh, really believe uh, in uh, what Musmesh is writing here. I think the, uh, this future is coming closer and closer, and I'm very excited to see uh, where these tools and these approaches uh, will bring a structural design in the future. So thank you very much for your attention. And now I would be very happy to discuss with you if there is still a bit of time. <laughs> Thank you, Pierluigi, for the interesting talk and the nice discussion. Your uh, time and efforts are really much appreciated. Yeah, so at the end of uh, this talk, I want to highlight our upcoming talk in about uh, two weeks on the 10th of May at four. Uh, we will hear about cyber physical systems to enable responsive buildings provided by Professor Alice Alipur, who is joining us from Iowa State University. Until that, thanks again for your attention today and uh, looking forward to meet you again. Thanks and bye-bye.